Hello, and welcome to the Inside Writing Podcast. I am your host, Josh Sippy. As a reminder, all of these episodes are recorded live Wednesdays, 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern time. You can sign up on the Gotham Writers website for free. Now then, on to the show. Today, we're talking with Linz Amer. Linz creates LGBTQ plus and intersectional social justice media for kids and families. They are the founder and CEO of Queer Kid Creative and creator of their beloved LGBTQ plus family web series, Queer Kids Stuff, and accompanying podcast, Rainbow Parenting. They also write and consult for children's television, including their work on the Webby award-winning Blues Clues and You Pride Parade music video, the Faye and Fluffy show, and more. Their queer and gender-affirming parenting book is out in 2023. Linz, welcome to the show. Hello. Hi there. Thank you for having me. Of course. Thanks for being here. So, Linz, I want to start where we always do this season, which is I want to ask you when you felt like you'd really broken in and you were doing it as a writer, was there a moment where it sort of dawned on you or is it a gradual thing? Yeah. So I think that, so I'm, I'm in a couple of different industries, right? So I think that there were different points of breaking in, in those different spaces. Um, I'd say in like the digital content world, it was when queer kids stuff kind of started taking off. Um, I do feel like I've kind of receded from that world a little bit and I'm like trying to like punch my way back in um, after having kind of like been on hiatus for like a little while. Um, But in kind of like the book and publishing world, I would say probably when I sold my first book, um, that was definitely a breaking in moment. Um, And for like the TV film, kind of like Hollywood space, I feel like there are like a couple of layers to breaking in in that industry. Um, First, it definitely felt like getting my manager. That was kind of, that was a big step in that. I also am a performer and I actually just signed with a talent agent. So that kind of like feels like a breaking in of sorts, but in like the performance space. Um, And then I feel like that I'll feel like fully broken into those spaces. I think when like, I sell my first show or like I get my first like booked role and I have written like freelance episodes for kids TV, but, um, and so like, feel like I've kind of like found the side door a little bit, but haven't like broken through the gates yet. So sure. That's kind of the many layered answer to to your question. (laughs) Sure. So I'm curious, like when you feel those breaking in moments, Does it change you in any way? Do you feel more validated? Does it free things up? Or do you sort of feel like the same creator you've always been? Hmm. I think there's like a sense of ease that comes with it, at least for me. I think when I found my manager, I was just like really overwhelmed because I was kind of, I was doing a lot of hustling and like legwork on my own. So I was, I was networking. I was talking to a lot of different queer children's writers in the space, kind of getting acquainted with like a few sectors of people and, and, you know, doing the tree networking thing. And I felt like Um, I was just like having to manage a lot of relationships on my own without like a lot of knowledge about how the industry works itself. So I was, I felt a little bit like I was um, flying without, (laughs) without like a map Um, and also like trying to like hold a lot of information um, in that, like I didn't have context for. And so when my manager, when I signed with my manager, I was just kind of like, okay, you can like literally manage that part of things. And I can focus a little bit more on creative and also on like all of these other things that I'm working on. It started to up, it started taking up less space. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like what I found with almost each sector. I would say that I wasn't very far along when I got my um, book agent. Um, And that's like a little bit of a different thing. And I'm like less like embedded in that industry. Um, But yeah, I think, yeah, the sense of ease is definitely a big part of that. Sure. And you you mentioned a few things I want to get back to, but I want to start digging into some of the individual projects that you've started, that you've worked on, um, starting with your YouTube series, which is Queer Kid Stuff. So tell us a little bit about that, where it came from and... Start, we'll start with that and then we'll talk about how it blew up. 
Yeah, totally. So I, so my background is actually in children's theater. Um, that's what I studied in, in undergrad and kind of like where all of this came from. Like I was taking theater for young audiences classes and like working on like the craft part of that and was also taking queer theory classes in college and like I'm sure start very, very first starting to understand my identity. And I like kind of looked around and was like, oh, I can't like these spaces that I'm in come together. And I found that there wasn't really a lot that existed and went off to grad school in London and did like a random performance studies <laughs> master's degree where I did like a lot of like weird performance art. Um, and, but, but they, it also taught me um, kind of like a different way of looking at craft and like what my practice as an artist could be without having to be like a director who waited for a script to happen like I could generate my own artistic vision um that's kind of what that taught me and um I came back to the states and I kind of had this idea to create a YouTube series talking about like kind of queer theory stuff but like in a Mr. Rogers like style um for a preschool audience and um <laughs> grabbed a couple of friends who knew how to work camera and made like the lowest quality zero budget like pilot you could ever imagine and um had like a couple of connections to journalists and worked those and um it just kind of popped off and then like the neo-nazis found it and uh, lots of stuff there and it just kind of snowballed and we ended up making over 50 episodes in like four seasons on like the tiniest little budget you could possibly imagine on like all micro grants it was very very like mid-20s we're gonna <laughs> do the thing because people like it and i have a free space to shoot in <laughs> and uh uh, has since become like this huge point of my career and has gotten me a lot of opportunities because of it. Um, but all opportunities that I had to like hustle really hard for because I didn't have people like banging down my door to like mm -hmm. get into these spaces as like a queer and trans person. And like, I mean, we're this, what we're seeing around like trans kids and queer and I, and I'll get off my soapbox because um, we're, we're here to talk industry, not politics. And I think that like that actually is a really, really important part of how to fix things. Um, but I do want to talk about it for a second because as a queer trans person making queer and trans centered, yes, it is Pride Month. <laughs> um, uh, as a queer and trans person who's trying to be in the kids media space, um, all of the politics that we're seeing around trans kids and queer kids and all this stuff, like the drag queen story hour that just got ambushed in mm -hmm. San Lorenzo, California, like that is all stuff that was happening to me in 2016 around queer kid stuff. Like we're seeing, I'm seeing the same exact thing happen just on a national stage, which is absolutely terrifying, um, but shows just like how far we've come in this like thing bubbling up. And like, when I say people weren't knocking down my doors, I'm saying that like, I had to like build the as big a thing as possible to say like hey come over here look at me and just start pounding the pavement and and looking for people who who would care and mm. who believed in me and I think I'm pretty decent at uh convincing people <laughs> that what <laughs> I believe to be important is important to them too um and that's just I think I'm generally pretty charming and that works to my benefit. Um, and I'm not trying to like toot my own horn or anything here. I'm just trying to like talk about the tools that I use and my performance background is a big part of that. And um, we're not at the advice part yet, but um, I, I think everyone needs to take an acting class or a storytelling class. That is like the biggest thing that has gotten me where I am is just like being able to talk to people about what I do and why it's important. Um, but that wasn't your question. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> like I said, you are free to digress. There was nothing in there that was irrelevant. So please feel free whenever you want to digress, go for it. That's what we're here for. Um, oh, you were, we were talking about queer kids stuff. Yes. Um, but yeah, I covered most of that. Um, mm -hmm. it's, I, I ended it in 2019 for a lot of different reasons. The harassment was a lot. Um, mm -hmm. The low budget was a lot. Um, it was just, it was, it was high effort, um, low reward for the most part, although it still lives on YouTube and we still get huge numbers during every Pride Month. Um, I would love nothing more than to be able to reboot it with a budget. Um, mm -hmm. If any executives are watching this, <laughs> um, but 
it now it's kind of turned into a larger, like a small business. Um, so we do educational content um, through our weekly newsletter. We have a project called Dear Queer Kid, where we commission um, really cool queer, trans, and non-binary grown-ups to write letters to like Dear Queer Kid. Um, we just had. Um, we actually just released the letter for June today, and it was written by Miss Major, which is like absolutely epic, like completely honored and humbled to be able to release something like that to the world. Um, and we just launched a podcast for parents um, called Rainbow Parenting, which is a, an extension of the book that I've been writing over the last year, if, mm. um, if that's a helpful segue at all. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. And, and there were just a couple other things I wanted to ask you about the YouTube channel itself, because, yeah. you know, it's, it's one thing to create it. It's another thing to get it out there. And I'm always mm -hmm. curious, even if it was nothing, like, did you put marketing into it? What were you doing to sort of spread the word? Even if maybe you weren't, maybe it was just a natural thing. You know, I, it's interesting because it really was all publicity. Mm -hmm. um, and that was because it was like a hot button idea. Like if I like saw a gap, there was a niche that I filled. I think um, navigating publicity is interesting because it doesn't work for me anymore. It mm -hmm. doesn't, it's, it's not like I send out press releases and like, you know, email my contacts and like most of the time I don't get anything back. Um, people were just interested in the series and I think it's because nothing like it existed. Mm -hmm. And now the space is like getting a little more crowded, which is awesome. Like I'm so glad I'm not the only one anymore. Um, and it's, and, I mean, generally there's just so much more content out there even than there was in 2016. So it's just mm -hmm. harder to break through the noise, but yeah, I, it just, it did, it broke through the noise. And I think like the controversy around it too, as like, terrible as it was, I do think there's something to be said about like, it brings eyeballs mm -hmm. and it was controversial. And it was also right as, I mean, it was May, 2016 is when I launched the series, which was a little bit more than six months away from Trump getting elected. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, that was also the time when like all of these anti quote unquote anti-feminists were on YouTube and were making reaction videos and that drove up my you know engagement and stuff for better or for worse and so there were a lot of different factors that I don't know if something like queer kids stuff if it debuted today if it would get the same kind of play and maybe it would <laughs> um but you know it was uh I think it was a lot of publicity I didn't I really didn't I really didn't put any marketing dollars into it. It was just a lot of hustling, a lot of like this interview and that interview and just kind of keeping the show going and getting grants from people who, you know, would promote me and collaborations and just, just a lot of like elbow grease. Gotcha. So this, this YouTube channel grew into what is now Queer Kid Creative which is your own company. So tell us a bit about that. What sort of, what inspired you to get there and what the impetus is, was behind creating it? Yeah, um, I do want to make one more thing that I just thought of is that um, something that I tried to do on like the craft end of things was be as nimble as I could be about um, current events. Mm -hmm. So um, when like the height of Me Too and like Harvey Weinstein and all that stuff was going down, I wrote and produced an episode on consent. Um, so they're like, it's kind of like the Mr. Rogers way of, of, of making kids content that is relevant to what's going on politically. Um, so I think that like that also helped break through the noise a little bit. Cause like one of the like teen Vogue articles that was written about me was about that consent episode because of what was happening on politically. So that was just kind of like, hopefully like my creator brain, like doing something good. <laughs> um, but turning it into Queer Kid Creative and this kind of this small business and, and expanding it beyond the web series, um, I started doing live performances of kind of material from the web series, um, still as the web series was, um, I was actively producing it. Um, and that was because, I mean, I'm, I'm a theater performer at heart. That's my background. Um, and I really missed a live audience. I really did. Um, and that was just kind of like something like for me that like I needed to fulfill for myself because it's the analytics on like the back end of a YouTube channel are a number, you know, it's, and especially like 
what I was dealing with, like at the time YouTube hadn't had the like COPA violation shenanigans happen and the comment sections were still available on content me for kids, which is like not great. Um, and I, and I knew that wasn't great because the harassment in my comment section was horrific and I just didn't have any direct communication with the audience that was enjoying and, and, and using queer kid stuff in the way it should be used. And I feel like I've only recently started to rebuild those bridges, um, but it's been really difficult. And and turning it into those live shows was a big part of that. Going to schools and libraries, and I'm starting to kind of go to theaters and, and do lots of other stuff. Um, but I've been doing those events since, I want to say like 2017, something like that. Mm-hmm. And um, then the pandemic hit in 2019 and I couldn't do live shows anymore. Um, I started kind of switching to virtual, um, but I needed a new business model basically. So mm-hmm. out of necessity um, and I got some EIDL loans and that was helpful. And I hired a couple of people because I was tired of doing it all myself and needed to collab. I'm, I'm neurodivergent. I need people to like bounce ideas off of and to work with. And, and also like, I'm a white person and I am, I can't speak for an entire community. And like, there's this, there's a discomfort that I think I'll always feel about like being a white person who is the face of an organization. Right. And like, so we did a lot of work toward, okay, how can we, how can we name and ex- like explicitly name our values? How can we decenter me and recenter community values. And so we started kind of working from there and developing projects and coming up with ideas that we, you know, implemented in different ways and then finally kind of like found homes for and um, through a lot of trial and error. And now we've kind of settled into this model that we're kind of building. And I mean, really trying to be kind of like a I mean, is it possible to be an anti-capitalist business <laughs> in a capitalist <laughs> system? But we're we're trying and and we're trying to find stability. And I mean, the biggest problem is finances, right? Mm-hmm. And at the same time, as I'm kind of like building this like business and this space for the community, and that's very um uh it's a little bit more of like preaching to the choir. Whereas, and then also in the pandemic, like, I mean, I was on unemployment for like a year and a half for my service job. And so actually had the time for the first time to work on writing and work on this kind of like external work of like, not preaching to the choir. Mm -hmm. Right. And like, my craft is like an art, like I, at the end of all this, I'm an artist, not, not a business person. I don't have an MBA. I have, I have a, you know, a theater degree, (laughs) um, so the, the business stuff has been uh, quite a learning curve because they don't teach artists how to run businesses. Um, and that has, and especially like, there's just such a lack of um, resources for queer and trans people who are business owners. It's a real problem. It's just so male, cis male dominated and like very white dominated too, but like more so in like the cisness and the maleness. Um, and those are spaces that I'm generally very uncomfortable in. And I found, um, it's hard to find mentorship just like generally, um, for me, but like in particular in business. Um, and I've had meetings with plenty of people who are just like VC, like venture capitalist people and people who are trying to like scale to like million dollar businesses. And I'm just like, I just want to make my fun little art (laughs) (laughs) and like give, give whatever capital I could have back to the community. So it's a, uh, that's, that's kind of the journey and we're still, we're still figuring out. And like, I'm just kind of like, maybe this business model idea will work that we've stumbled <laughs> on. Who, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> you touched on this a little bit, but I wanted to revisit it because it's a lot of work creating a business. And like you said, at, at your heart, you're creative. So what, how were you balancing all of those non-creative activities and things you had to do to get this started while still tapping into your creative side or was that side just kind of on hold for it for a time? I think that they talk to each other constantly. Mm. I think that I am a good business person because I'm a good ideator. I am good at coming up with ideas and I think interesting ideas. And, and I think like 
I think a big gift of my theater background was like student theater. I, I went to Northwestern and there's a huge, huge student theater community there. And they would just put up shows. Like you would go to a garage and you would make a set and they would put it up and like all just like of people's own like passion and will. And like, I think it's so easy to ideate and just like let it sit there. Um, and it's another thing to be able to take something from idea, hone and develop that idea, test it and put it out in the world and then continue to test it and continue to put it out consistently. And like, I've never been great at all of those things, but like somehow I got here and um, uh, it's sort of working and I think it's going to continue to work and get better. Um, and just like learning along the way and not being like scared to like try something new. I think it's been a lot of like, I'm just gonna persist um, <laughs> and just like, a blind ambition a little bit and you know it's uh you just kind of gotta like go for it and like I also speak as like someone who has had access to a lot of privilege and like educational opportunities and like that is a huge part of it um I'm also married and like share finances with my wife who right now has a full-time job, but is also a writer and a journalist. So we've been on and off freelance at different points out of our lives. Um, I was in service for a while to make ends meet. I teach music on the side. Like I'm not just doing all of this only through like my business as a revenue stream. I'm also doing all the writing and like I have, I could not count for you how many revenue streams that I have that allow me to survive um and like that's the reality of it and like people always ask me like how do you do it and I'm like I have ADHD like that's how I do it <laughs> and I have a lot of like like you see my whole like whiteboard over here it's got like all of my projects on it for like object permanence um so yeah it's a uh, the business stuff and the creative stuff are very intertwined for me which I think is like the good part of me being a business person is like the creative side of things and like kind of like the artistic director side of things, the stuff I'm not great at. And like, has been a really big learning curve is the finance stuff. Um, and like the legal stuff and like, I eventually hired an accountant <laughs> and like a dude like pro bono helped me make up some spreadsheets that I keep track of <laughs> stuff on. And like, I hired a lawyer to help me for my LLC. So like knowing, I think like something that also like from the creative end of things is like, and just like leadership is like knowing how to delegate and how to delegate well. And that is also a learned skill. Mm -hmm. um, and just like focusing on, leadership skills and like thinking about how you want to be a leader, mm. I think is, is something that I think about a lot. And I've done some like executive coaching in the past as well on that. And I think that like, that's something that I'm constantly um, navigating for myself and like for my staff and also just like for this like business and like community space that we're trying to create too. Like I'm also a leader in that way. Mm. Um, and I think that those are things that are really important and also are part of my artistic and creative background, right? Sure. So I think it's, I think that creativity and business are very intertwined, um, but there are definitely things that are missing <laughs> from that. And that is where I've had to kind of like scavenge and like make it work. So speaking of, you know, you mentioned all the different projects you've got going on. I want to touch on another uh, avenue that you've gone into, which is the podcasting world. And you've got Rainbow Parenting, you've got Activist You. So mm -hmm. tell us how you, I mean, it seems like a natural transition to go from YouTube to making podcasts as well, but tell us a little bit about the journey to get there and what your experience was in creating these podcasts. Yeah, so um, uh, Activist You was kind of a pandemic project. Um, I was had the idea and was thinking about it kind of before we went into lockdown. And then when we did, I just kind of um, more actively was producing it. Uh, yeah. I agree that like you coming from YouTube into podcasting was a pretty natural jump. Um, but I would say it did also come out of like a huge frustration with YouTube. Mm -hmm. And like the fact that when you're making videos and like you're on YouTube like that, like you are beholden to a platform, like you are at the behest of like, the YouTube people and they treated me in particular 
in, excuse me, in particular, extremely poorly. Um, I'm actually in the middle of a lawsuit against them still, which has been ongoing for a very long time. Um, hopefully we'll have updates about that soon. Um, but um, I wanted to find a medium that was a little bit more platform agnostic um, mm. and more controllable from the creator side of things. And um, I started kind of wading into the kids podcasting world, um, which is a beautiful community that I love. Um, and also like kids podcasting is like still, I mean, it's been this way for the past, like however many years, but it's still very wild, wild west. Um, and it's getting a little bit more <laughs> corporatized slowly. Um, but I'm on the board of an organization called Kids Listen, which is um, all like indie kids podcast creators. They're fantastic. Um, and I just, uh, I will say that like Activist U, I, so it's only got the one season. Um, we're talking about some a company acquiring it and potentially helping produce a season two. Um, that's still very much in talks, um, but is a very exciting prospect. Um, it was a pain in the butt to produce. <laughs> so that's why there's no season two. Um, wrangling um, kids to interview is um, a lot more difficult than you'd think because you're... <laughs> the just the communication of it all is like yeah because you're talking to parents and like not everyone has audio stuff and it's yeah it's it's a whole thing um so I took a a second um to figure out what I wanted because I, did, I didn't want to just like make a podcast and make a podcast and I was rattling around I've got a couple of pitches for like fiction podcasts that I love that I would love to make one day um for kids um but I and I've, and I've always thought about like, what would a queer kid podcast, queer kid stuff podcast look like? And just like pulling the audio from the web series and making it into a podcast didn't feel right. Um, I like to make work that is specific to the medium that it's in. I think that that's really important. Um, and is, I think why I'm in a lot of different mediums, <laughs> um, but also like work on adapting ideas from medium to medium. And like, that's a, that's a skill set too. Um, but I think uh, starting Rainbow Parenting, I was really born out of the book. Um, the, and we can we can talk about that separately as well, because um, I think that they're very intertwined. But um, I had a, I, it really was sparked because I had a friend reach out who's in the podcasting world, um, who Amanda McLaug. I don't actually know how to pronounce her last name, um, but she runs multiple multitude productions um, and she's a good friend from my YouTube era. <laughs> and um, she kind of DM'd me and was like, after my book announcement came out and was like, would you want to do a podcast about this? And I was like, hmm, I don't think about that. Um, and when we went through a process of like trying to get money for it and no one wanted to give us money for it. So we just, I ended up getting a different deal that I was like, I'll use this money to make the podcast. And um, I've just, I've been producing it over the last couple of months and honestly I haven't felt this good about creating something in like a really long time I'm super super proud of it and like it feels it's the, one of the first times we're doing uh specifically adult facing content mm -hmm. um which is similar to the book the book is uh, for grown-ups as well um but I think it's something that was missing from what we've been doing because I think for a long time I was so focused on kids and uplifting and affirming queer, trans, non-binary kids and their allies. But I think especially with like what's going on politically in the world, like it's one thing for like a kid to understand themselves, but like what to, to an extent, what good is that if their parents aren't on board as mm -hmm. well? Um, and so the, I kind of started thinking about that and like also like parents are gatekeepers, educators are gatekeepers. And like, how can we, how can we, go up to those gatekeepers and, and recruit them. Um, that's been kind of like a big part of the podcast and the book and figuring out this kind of like missing key to the work. Um, so that's uh, kind of a little bit about <laughs> how the podcast stuff happens. And I want to ask you too, you, you got to this there at the end where you're talking about writing towards adults now, as opposed to towards children. And I'm always curious how writers adjust their content towards their audience it sounds mm -hmm. like you're more naturally writing towards children. Like that, that seems like where you've been with children's theater and whatnot. Was it difficult acclimating towards writing towards adults or did that come naturally too? No, it, it's actually interesting because I've been getting feedback on the podcast that parents are listening to it with their kids. Um, so I'm just kind of like, I think that my work 
almost always will be all ages. Mm-hmm. Um, I think like, I haven't like tried to like curse or like be explicit in anything in particular. And that's on purpose. Um, and <laughs> maybe I'll make something that's like only for grownups, but for the, uh, because I am an adult and I do adult things and I am not just beholden to this like squeaky clean persona. There's a lot of problems with that. Um, but I need to have more power in order to explore that more, more fully. And that's complicated and nuanced. And I don't think we'll be able to break um, really into that here. Um, and that's okay. Um, but yeah, that that's a complicated thing that I just wanted to bring up, but um, is complicated. Um, but I, I really just think I write for all ages. Um, most of what I do, I really, I, for like the executives and for marketing purposes, I am almost always asked what age is this for? Um, and I, I always, I hate that question. And I know it's a necessary evil for selling things. Um, for the most part is why people ask that question. Um, and sometimes for tone, I think like when people are talking about like preschool television in particular, that's sometimes a tonal question, which I kind of disagree with, but is helps people position how they're thinking about my work sometimes, which is helpful um, in being able to control how people might perceive what I'm doing and what narratives I'm trying and stories I'm trying to tell. Um, but I think, I think what I try and do is make things accessible. That is like what I think I'm good at. I think I'm good at simple. I think I'm good at universal truths. Um, and I think that that those two things are what make it all ages. I think like the difference with the podcast is that like I'm using a slightly bigger vocabulary. I'm talking about more complex ideas that I'm not necessarily putting the building blocks in in there and like building those up um, at the level that I would do in a kid's um, setting. So for me, it's like I, the difference between like approaching queer kid stuff or any of the work that I do for kids versus approaching rainbow parenting and some of the work that we're starting to do for grownups is assuming that grownups will have some of these building blocks. And that's also not necessarily true because I am trying to meet people where they're at for sure. But I also have to assume a little bit that like, if you're here and you're exploring this space and interested in this space, you probably have already done a certain amount of work. Mm -hmm. So I don't think like Ben Shapiro is going to come to my podcast with those blocks built up. Like, I think that there's a big difference between someone who is like already in like radical justice spaces, but is maybe like cis and straight and still functions within the heteropatriarchal systems that we live in versus someone who is like, <sighs> yeah, I don't know. I was trying to get that with that. <laughs> but, but like, that, that's what I'm trying to say is that like, it's about, I'm kind of making assumptions mm-hmm. when I'm approaching work for grownups that I wouldn't make when I'm approaching work for kids. Sure. And then I want to transition to another project you're working on because you have so many projects out there. <laughs> uh, you have a book out there too. And, and I want to hear it's not how out. that- It's not out there. It's coming out, 2023. Yes, sorry. Um, yeah. I want to hear how that came about. And also because you mentioned how book publishing wasn't sort of your primary path. So, so what sort of prompted you to go down that route as well? Yeah, my um my journey into publishing is interesting, um, and I think a little bit of a unicorn situation. Um, I was first approached by an editor at Penguin um, about conceiving a picture book, um, without like any real idea of how to write a picture book. That's why I took the children's um, literature class that we took together at Gotham. Um, I was just kind of like oh what is this <laughs> how do you write picture books picture books are incredibly difficult to write um and I, I that class was helpful um and I was developing this manuscript and I was working with that editor on that manuscript and it wasn't really going anywhere I don't think it, it ended up being like 
a good idea. Maybe it was a good idea. It wasn't being executed well. Something was off with it. Um, and so we were kind of going back and forth on that manuscript for a while. And I was like, I think that like, if we ever get anywhere with this or like any anything happens, I want to make sure that I have an agent and I want to make sure that I have someone who can be in my corner. And so I asked that editor that I was working with if she had any, any recommendations, which like, I don't know if you're actually like supposed to do that, <laughs> but I... I feel like a lot of my career is built on me just shooting my shot with <laughs> with people and like sending cold emails and like maybe doing the wrong thing, but people being like kind to me and like understanding and not thinking I'm like rude or like <laughs> violating some social contract. Um, again, the neurodivergence may be helping <laughs> in that way. Um, and she sent me three agents to query mm-hmm. and I sent those three agents my picture book manuscript that we were working on with like a little bit of background about me. Um, And I I think having that body of work of queer kid stuff and like all the accolades that that had and all of that really gave me a huge leg up. Um, But I, so I queried those three people, two of them passed. And the last one was um, Claire Draper, who is my Mm. current publishing agent. And I've been with them for a long time now. I want to say it's like four years. Um, Uh, And then we were kind of kicking around that picture book manuscript. It went on sub, got passed on by everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, We, even the agent, the editor that we were, I was initially working with, um, I ended up doing my TED talk in summer of 2019. Um, I also like kind of sat on my agent for a while and like wasn't really doing anything because I didn't know what to do with them. Um, And, and I think like, that's okay. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, I mean, obviously you don't want to like get dropped. um, But that was, I just like, didn't really know what I wanted to do with it. And like, and that's fine. Um, But I did the Ted talk and like that blew up and, um, and they like featured it on the front page of Ted.com and all this stuff. And I was just kind of like, maybe I could expand this Ted talk into a book. (laughs) <laughs> and so I started talking to my agent about developing a nonfiction proposal for a book that um, would expand on the TED Talk. And oh my lordy, we went through so many iterations of that proposal. That took freaking forever um, and is like basically nowhere near the book that ended up getting sold. We <laughs> went back and forth on that proposal for so long. I want to say it, like, maybe a year, maybe a year and a half to two years we were working on that proposal. Um, And nonfiction proposals are hard, really hard. Um, I mean, like, I don't envy fiction writers who have to have a whole manuscript that they can even query with. Um, But yeah, writing a nonfiction proposal is really difficult. Um, And we put it on sub, um, I think like January of 2021 passed by everyone except for one person and we got a revise and resubmit from another editor um and that's when the and actually from two from both of those people um maybe a third I think um and so I revised the proposal to make it a little bit more in like the parenting sector and like um, reorganize some things. And it, I mean, that even that proposal is still very far from the book that ended up um, coming out of it. Um, but yeah, and then we had, I guess we had an auction um, that I think was like best bid um, and sold the parenting book in March of 2021. Um, and I went to St. Martin's Press Macmillan and, um, I have been working on it ever since I, um, fair warning, never put in a book proposal that you will take six months to write it. Please give yourself a year. I was a terrible person to myself and gave myself six months. Also during the busiest time, maybe of my life, I got married in that time period. I basically wrote the first draft of the book in three months, which I do not recommend writing 600,000 <laughs> words in three months. Um, and then I ended up having to do a bunch of revision rounds. Um, so my manuscript actually only just got accepted officially by my editor after a fourth 
revision round. Um, I also had to switch editors in the middle of my process. Um, my original editor who bought the manuscript mo- or bought the proposal um, moved to a different um, uh, different publishing house entirely. Um, so I have had a new, a- uh, new editor um, on the book and we are just now, I'm just starting to get blurbs um, and start on, because paper is like backed up like a year so it's not going to come out until like may of next year Mm -hmm. um but that's been the book process (laughs) (laughs) so this seems like a good time to ask uh you know in a six-year period a lot has happened you're you're balancing a lot of stuff you Mm -hmm. know you've mentioned the whiteboard how do you stay organized how do you do you like set what what's your process do you set boundaries for yourself or do you just kind of fly to whatever you need to work on at any moment um, it's definitely deadline based, um, and just kind of like an understanding of what each process kind of needs. And like, if it's like a long form project or if it's a short form project. So like, if I'm writing a freelance script for TV, like usually that's a preschool show. And like, those are 11 minute episodes. And I've gotten to a point where I can kind of bang those out over like, couple hours over like each on like three days and I'll just like block that off of my calendar of like I need this many days that like I have writing time and like I just don't do like meetings and stuff those days or like I mean June is kind of an outlier because June is just like always the busiest month for me um but uh I think yeah it's just been blocking off time and like I know if like I've got a book deadline. That means like, I need to make sure that like every Friday leading up to that book deadline, I have time um, to work on the book. Um, But I'm pretty fast. um, And that really helps. And I've, that I've just kind of always been that way. I've just always kind of been a fast writer Um, and different projects just kind of like need different space in my brain. And that's just kind of been something I figured out over time. Um, but yeah, I mean, I have a, I, I am locked to my Google calendar. (laughs) That is my like saving grace and like needing to block off periods of time and even days, full days where I'm just writing or like even just putting like a specific project on that block um, has been really important for my time management. And then like the whiteboard and like, I have multiple systems where I'm keeping different things um, organized just so my brain knows, like I have a whole spreadsheet that's like my whole slate of things (laughs) in like across multiple industries. And like, I have like a color coding and like a bolding system of like this thing I'm like developing this thing I'm currently writing and is sold. This thing is like, already launched and like in the content ether. Um, so it's, it's just, yeah, there are a lot of tools that I use to, um, figure out just like what plates I'm juggling. And that helps on like a week by week basis. Um, just kind of like shifting things around and prioritizing Mm -hmm. to do lists are, are a big, are a big part of it. For sure. And then you mentioned something I want to go back to, which is you did a Ted talk, which is like one of those milestones. It's like, I feel like once you hit that, it's just like a whole new world. So where were you as a creative when that TED talk opportunity came? Like, were you surprised by it? Was it something that you kind of foresaw in some way coming or where were you when that happened? Yeah, it was definitely a goal that I had had for a long time. Um, I did the TED talk through a TED residency program. So this is when I was still living in New York and I applied to their residency program that they had. I'm not sure if they're doing it anymore. I know they still have the fellowship program. Um, cause I get emails to, to apply to it and I'm like, <laughs> been there, done that. Um, and I, so I worked with like a cohort and like was working with the TED staff, um, to develop the talk and, um, yeah, it was a really great experience. I mean, I think what the TED talk did for me is that, I mean, I used those headshots for a long time and, um, I, it gave me a really excellent calling card. Mm -hmm. So like, basically it's like my version of a business card. Like I've linked to it in my email signature for the last, like how many years it's, it's existed (laughs) on the internet. And like people immediately are like, Oh, I get you. I get what you do. And when they come into a meeting with me and like a talk with me, they already have like a broad strokes idea of like, 
what I'm about. And then they get to talk to me about like how I can be helpful to them in their specific niche or sector. Mm -hmm. And then there was something else you mentioned that I want to get to as well. Uh, We're running out of time, but I wanted to ask about, uh, you mentioned how getting a TV film manager was so sort of game changing. Was Mm -hmm. was that something you've been pursuing for a while or or how, how, what was that sort of journey like? Because it sounds like that's more the space that you were looking for as opposed to book publishing. So was that something you've been pursuing for even longer? Um, yeah, I think that like, I, so, (laughs) I mean, like the first, one of the first big things I ever wrote was like a play when I was in high school. And then when I went to college, um, I like, wasn't like a playwriting hotshot in the theater program and like, was like, kind of, um, felt like a little disconnected from my writing at that point um and didn't feel like a writer as much and I had been sitting on this screenplay idea for a really long time and um (laughs) finally like I like took a Gotham class I took the screenwriting one Gotham class and was like oh this like actually is a good idea that I should start writing and like learn how to screenwrite and ended up taking the screenwriting two class as well and that like helped me And I was also doing this like creative residency program for queer kids stuff that, and I used some of that time to help me with the, um, with that, with that screenplay and ended up right finishing my first draft of it there, which um, I mean, was probably not great. Um, (laughs) And then, I mean, again, over the pandemic and lockdown, like what else was I going to do besides write? Um, That was, it really gave, it really like just freed up so much of my time to be able to like work on getting better at writing. Mm -hmm. And I uh, took that screenplay and I started submitting it to competitions, which are very expensive and annoying. And like, I had to learn what was like, a good critical note that was helpful versus like, what's a transphobic note. (laughs) Um, And so that was a bit of a learning curve too. And just kind of like slowly the script got better. I got better at revising. I was also kind of like figuring out how to write um, like, like pitch documents for TV shows. Like, like I, I kind of came up with a few of those and did some exercises on those. Um, I also met, um, two wonderful folks, um, uh, Jess and Mari from the Dubri group, which is like a group there. Um, they help people develop like kids shows. They're kind of like ex executives. Um, and they really, really, I met, I kind of reconnected with them over the pandemic. They had helped me early on in queer kids stuff with some marketing things. Cause they just found me and reached out. Um, and then I reconnected with them in the early stage of the pandemic and they helped me kind of develop an idea for a queer kid stuff, like extended universe preschool show, um, Mm. which I would love to make one day. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And so kind of like started really learning how to develop a TV show, develop a good idea for a TV show and like bring it farther than just a pilot script and um, really, really honed um, the feature script. And eventually I, um, uh, I submitted the feature script to a screen craft animation competition and I was a finalist. Um, and so connect, I connected with them and with Coverfly, um, who are wonderful. And, um, Jeffrey over there who just started to get querying me out to different people and giving me different emails to introduce myself to. And we went, I, I got turned down by so many people <laughs> um, until I hit the right one. And, and that was really it. It was, it was very needle in a haystack um, mm-hmm. because I think that I have the only trans manager in all of kids animation. Mm-hmm. I really hope someone can prove me wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure that's true. Um, and that was just like, I, Jeffrey gave me the right email one day. <laughs> um, and I had, uh, and, and yeah, that was, that was really what that was. And that's kind of when I, I don't know, things just kind of, I, a lot of the freelance connections I've had and like scripts that I've done haven't necessarily been through my manager either. Um, like the first preschool scripts that I wrote were because I networked with people at a, ran at like a kid's screen conference, um, mm-hmm. which is like the kids media um, trade publication. Um, if anyone's interested in children's television or children's media at all, go and subscribe to the um, 
kids green newsletter it's it's very corporate but like at least it gives you a lot of good information about like what's going on in in the industry um as a trade publication um but yeah that's kind of like the story of that um yeah and I also like was um had gotten introduced through another networking contact um to the team at the um Blues Clues and You YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. And I consulted with them and on the um, Blues Clues and You Pride Parade video that went like super viral on Twitter and then recently won two Webby Awards. Um, and I was, because I was introduced to that team, they had projects that came up later in the year. And I've now since I wrote 10 episodes of a nursery rhymes project with them um, at the end of last year and have um, since I'm, I'm now working on a uh, a series that I co-developed and I'm working on with them and co-producing with them now. Um, so that has given me work and it's really just like talking to people <laughs> and like meeting people. And like my manager helps with that. And like we've been taking a show out to pitch and that's been like a fun new thing. Um, but yeah, it just like is a lot of different, it's, it's about like reaching critical mass to an extent. Mm-hmm. And I want to add, ask as well, because you've mentioned, and obviously, you know, every writer, every creative goes through so much rejection. How do you stay positive through that? Especially, you know, when it comes in so mo- so often, even things that are beyond your control, how do you, how do you stay positive knowing that your creative vision is still what you're, what you want to do? Yeah, it's really hard. Um, uh, the rejection sensitive dysphoria and like neurodivergence of it all, it, it's hard. Um, I think that it was harder when I didn't have as much going on. Mm -hmm. Um, and now that I have uh, like a zillion different projects, I can (laughs) distract myself. Um, I also just like, I'm someone who one have, I've like built a lot of my career out of spite and it's a lot of like, I think people just like underestimate me and like, that's like a good way to like, even, even if that's not true, that's a good way (laughs) to like rationalize it of like, Oh, like F you, like you're transphobic. (laughs) Um, I'm literally pitching this to you, like as like trans kids are being attacked in state legislatures across the country. If you don't see why that's important and like why what I'm talking to you about right now is important and why you should green light this thing, like then I don't necessarily want to work with you. And like that is like your loss. Um, So I think like it's been a lot of like sometimes you got to make up make that stuff up a little bit for yourself and like rationalize it. Um, And sometimes it's true and sometimes it's not. Um, It really depends on the person. Um, But it's also just like a lot of like development execs have their mandates. Like they have specific things that they're looking for. And even if you think it's perfect for them and like is like in the vein of like this show they did and like you love like this creator you think you're kind of like in this way it they might like like I pitched a show to an executive one time and it was just like a little bit too close to a fantasy world of the show that they already had and they were like nope not gonna do it like because like my pitch had a unicorn in it and it's like it's like it's silly stuff like that it has nothing to do with your talent it has nothing to do most of the time it has nothing to do (laughs) with like you as a person it has so it's just it's capitalism Mm -hmm. (laughs) and like that for me is like a rationalization that like maybe it's a little bit made up sometimes but like helps me kind of get through and just kind of like okay, that sucked. Like, let's move on to the next thing. we got a lot of work to do, like in so many spaces. And like, it's uh, now that I have a lot of projects to bounce between that helps. Um, I also highly recommend if you're in that stage where you still are kind of like working on breaking in, working on getting all of those projects on your slates. Cause like that is, it's a really hard place to be in. Um, I, um, a lot of my anxiety um, around just like communication with people lessened when I got a mail tracker. So like, I just use like a mail track, whatever. And like, it just told me when like someone opened up an email. So like, if I sent them someone a script of mine, I like could like sneakily like know when they were opening it up again and like maybe looking at the script and like that, like eased my anxiety a little bit of just like, okay, like this person is like thinking about this because 
so much of like the TV film space is about like, like I like two weeks of like, you know, you shouldn't follow up before two weeks. And then like, you shouldn't follow up for another two weeks after that. And like, that just like makes my brain like whir and like go in all these different places. But like, if I know like, oh, like actually they like clicked it a couple of times. Like maybe that means they downloaded it. Maybe that means they're reading it and they're thinking about it or they're thinking about a response. Or if they are not touching it at all, it's kind of like, oh, okay, they're not interested. And like, then I don't waste my time thinking about that person. Um, So that's just like a weird little niche tool that like sort of helped me with my anxiety when I was in that stage. Gotcha. And then last two quick questions. First one, if you've given, again, so much good advice already, but if there was one thing for people that want to follow to do similar stuff that you're doing, what's one piece of advice you would give them? It's hard because I think that my path in particular has been very like jack of all trades um, and less about like honing in on one like like books or like TV. Like I'm not kind of like down one path in that way. I'm a lot more about like I'm very mission driven. Um, And I think like, that's the thing that's like really kept me going and is why I've pursued this like huge swath of things. And I think that's just kind of like what has activated my perseverance and like resilience in that. And also just like stubborn determination. So this is like parroting advice that a lot of people say, I think. Um, But like finding your mission, I think is so, so important for, and like, if that's just like, I like your mission is to like communicate your feelings (laughs) through your craft or like to tell your story. Like it doesn't have to be like big and grand. Like it can be a small mission, but like having something that is your North star to always go back to when you're not feeling your best when, because I I think that like becoming a better craftsperson for me was so much in service of that mission. And like, how can I fulfill this mission that I'm on to the best of my ability is, is how I kind of, how I keep pursuing all of these things, but also how I keep getting better, I think, and is how I can bring myself to my work as well of like, I want to, I am like, I want to do this work for queer and trans people and like center these narratives. I am a queer and trans person. I am on like a healing journey for myself. And like, I'm bringing my experiences and like the way that I'm walking through the world as a queer and trans person to this mission. And I think that like, that's really, it's made a huge, huge difference. Mm -hmm. And then last but certainly not least, your chance to promote. Where can people find you? Uh, what should they be looking for? Uh, as a reminder, all of these will be in our show notes. So if you don't hear them, just check the show notes uh, at the bottom of the show. But go ahead, promote whatever you yeah, want to. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, um, I'm very easily Googleable. I think. Um, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Linz Amer, L-I-N-D-Z-A-M-E-R. Um, my stories are really where it's at on Instagram. And if you want my activism, that's on Twitter. I am uh, testing out TikTok at queer mixter Rogers. I'm not like good at it yet. If you've got, if anyone has tips, please let me know. (laughs) Um, And then for queer kids stuff, you can find queer kids stuff at queer kids stuff, um, Instagram, Twitter, uh, make sure if you want that content, um, we've got a weekly newsletter that you can subscribe through just like link in bio situation. Um, queerkidsstuff.com has a lot of info too. Um, and then rainbow parenting is our podcast and you can find that wherever you get your podcasts and activist. You also still exists and queer kids stuff still exists on YouTube. Um, and I think I think those are the the plugs. Oh, and Patreon. We have a Patreon page. We're actually doing a promotion this month. Um, If you sign up or are a patron patron already and go like up a level or something, um, we'll send you a limited edition sticker bundle. So (laughs) (laughs) you can wrap queer good stuff on your laptop or water bottle or whatever. 
Love that. Lens, thank you so much for being here. This was a great conversation. I appreciate you taking the time and for going a little over with us. I really appreciate you doing that. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for having me. It's This is this is the chess game stuff that I love talking about <laughs> that I don't get to talk about very often. <laughs> well, it was a great conversation. All of our listeners, uh, thank you for being here. We're here next week on Tuesday, not Wednesday, on Tuesday next week, and we will see you then. Bye-bye.